Colorful Radio. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Colorful Radio listeners, and a very warm welcome to the Africa Center here in Southwark, London. My name is Kenneth Tharp. I'm director of the Africa Center, and I'm delighted to welcome our studio audience, as well as those listening in on air, to this morning's Jabba Talk live event with Jacqueline Malcolm and a very special guest. The Africa Center, as many of you know, has a rich history dating back to the opening of its historic home in Covent Garden in 1964 by the first president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda. And I'm pleased to say it has another Kenneth now attached to his present. What I suspect very few of you will know is that we discovered last summer through our archives that there was actually a pilot Africa Center in Sloan Street in Chelsea in 1958. So we discovered last year, it's quite by surprise, that we were over 60 years old. At the Africa Center, we are proud of our past and passionate about our future. We work to promote the diversity of Africa and its diaspora by highlighting creativity and innovation in African thought, art, culture, business, and entrepreneurship. And our vision is of a contemporary 21st century Africa, vibrant, global, and seated at the table. And our new home here in Southwark happens to be based in the London borough with the largest black African population. Now, for those of you here in the studio, I would like just for a moment to invite you to cast your eye to the left out of the window. And what you can see is a large, uh, expansive brick wall. Um, that's actually the side of what's known as Gunpowder House, and it's actually owned by the Africa Centre. Last December, we managed to secure a 1.6 million grant from the Mayor of London's Good Growth Fund to redevelop that building. And right now, we're in the middle of a tender process for the architect and design team who will help us develop that building into an Africa center for the 21st century. Our central aim is to become the most welcoming cultural hub in London, which leads me to say, uh, without giving their name away just yet to our listeners, how delighted I am to welcome today's special guest to the Africa Centre. Thank you again to our studio audience for coming, and to all those listening in, I will now leave you in the very capable hands of Jacqueline Malcolm, who will introduce our special guest. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. So we are on Jabba Talk on Colourful Radio, and of course, you listening in, you know me, I'm not going to change, I, I can't change, I am who I am, but we are so excited today, and first of all, before I introduce the guest officially, thank you all to our live audience who have come in today, so say hello to our listening in audience, everyone. <laughs> you see, now I promise you today I'm not lying, that is not number 16 button, I have a 16 button that I normally press when I need a chair. And that was an actual live audience. I'm going to prove it because they're going to do it again and they're not going to sound identical. And again. <laughs> you see this? You see this? I'm so excited. And everyone's smiling, looking absolutely beautiful. And what an eclectic group of people we have here. Thank you all for coming. But I know that the cheering, really, that we really want to take a moment. Because I know this is like a Tuesday morning. Everyone has work busy lives going on, but as soon as I put out the word that we had this special guest with us today, I know that everybody was like itching to get tickets and come along. And of course, in our presence today, we have the author, we have the uh, broadcaster, we have the parliamentarian, we have the outright awesome <laughs> national treasure, Melvin Bragg. Thank you. <laughs> I actually do, I won't keep calling you sir either. He is Lord Melvin Bragg, he's asked me not to call him that. We, we are calling him Melvin today. And I, seriously, I, I feel quite intimate with you because I've been uh, researching you. Ah, oh, we, have, we have sound. Okay, so I've been researching you now for like the last month as soon as we met you um, at your book launch. And I, what a story. I have to say, I have made so many assumptions about who you are and what you stand for, and I was so wrong on so many levels. You're a delight to read, and I'm going to stop talking and let you at least say hello to everyone first. Hello. hello. I, was, I met this young lady when I was going into Hatchards to do a book signing, and um, we stopped and we talked, and we talked, 
and resume, and we talked on. Yeah. I said, the easiest way to resolve this is if you come into the book signing with me. Yeah, that was exactly it. And it really, really wasn't me, it was Namdi, coach, yeah. who everybody knows. And as soon we we just come out of Fortnum and Mason's, and we just come out on the street, and then he saw Melvin Bragg, and he said, oh my gosh, because um, Namdi is an absolute, like, number one mega fan of yours. And he's like, Jackie, Jackie, look, it's Melvin Bragg, look. And we literally did follow you into your book signing, and then you very kindly gave a book and then we left and then I contacted your office and I was like, please let him come on the show and you came. And so I started by researching and I thought, well, I'm going to list all of his awards. Oh no. Oh no, I did the same thing. There's too many. You have awards just for being a person, for your, for, for your literature, for your, I mean, I mean, no, seriously, it goes on and on and on for your broadcasting. Your, um, I mean, chairman of board of television. I mean, you see, you've got to remember this is a career that goes on from, well, 1960s, because you were born in 1939, and then your career started straight away in 1960s. So I'm going to let you start talking, and we're going to start from the beginning, because here's one of my myths that I thought. I assumed that you were a man born with a silver spoon, in your mouth, fixed firmly, and all of these things were just handed to you on a silver plate, but you were working class. Yeah, my, my, <clears throat> I was born in a little town in the northwest of England. I think you could call it a working class town, there were one or two doctors and that, but basically it was a couple of factories, 5,000 people, 12 churches, uh, churches and chapels. Uh, my father worked in the man's factory, my mother in the woman, she made buttonholes for nine years, and then when she got married, she was fired. That's what happened in those days, because they didn't like employing married women in case they took a few weeks off to have a child. So um, she was illegitimate. I didn't know that at the time. She was fostered. And uh, we lived at a time in, in the house of her foster mother and other people who'd been fostered. My father was one of nine. His father was one of 16 children, and my father passed a couple of scholarships. He was a very bright man, but couldn't take up either of them because they weren't uh, rich enough to afford the uniform. So he left school at 14, went down the mines, then worked as a laborer, uh, and then worked as a semi-skilled man at the factory, and eventually ended up running a small beer house, and, uh, which we moved into when I was eight, because he wanted to be his own boss. So we lived in this small town, which um, I thought was paradise, actually. I thought it was absolutely terrific. Uh, it was uh, everything that the kid would want. The streets were more or less empty because there were hardly any cars. Well, there were hardly any cars anywhere, so it isn't a deprivation of that area. This was England when we were at war. So you had this little old-fashioned medieval street uh, with back alleys and rundles. And we, we, it was hours in the evening. We played games all over the place. And what happened in the war <coughs> all over the place, I suppose, but I only know about my own community, is that the men who came back from the war, and the women whose men were away at the war, one of the things they seemed to have decided, collectively and unconsciously, was to give people, give the kids as good a time as they could. Or, or everything was made by them. There were youth clubs, there were sports clubs, there, each of the churches did something, there were three choirs, there were social evenings, and you went everywhere. I went to the Salvation, I was Church of England in the choir from the age of six. I mean, you went to the Salvation Army, you went to the Roman Catholics, because they did the best dances, you went to the Methodists, because they had the ping pong table, you went to the Congregationalists, because <laughs> they had the bands there, playing the band, the brass bands playing there. And that was a wonderful thing. They had a small swimming pool, given by baths, given by a local philanthropist, so we were all decent swimmers in the town. And what else? I can't think, I can't think of a better place to be brought up. It was rich in everything that mattered. People, a lot of people in distress, a lot of people finding it hard to make ends meet, an awful lot of poverty. I mean, I look back at it now, the centre of the town's been scooped out, but it was a slum. It was a real slum. One street was not much longer than this stretch here. It had 147 dwellings in it. And we lived there, and there was a, a TB epidemic there in 1946. I got TB, my mother got TB. It was a big TB hit area. Um, and then they cleaned that out and the council houses around the town grew up. But it was that sort of town. And those are the people I knew. And I just look back being <coughs> extremely contented. One of the things that did you 
to you was that you knew everybody in the town. I was known to everybody in the town. If I, if I may say so, you don't mind, listeners, if I may put this post. I was famous from the age of about four because when I walked up street, I was Stanley Bragg's boy or Ethel Bragg's son. And the, my Stanley and Ethel, they played quite a big part in the town. They helped to run things. So that's who I was. I mean, I, I had a name as well, but that, <laughs> that was a long way back. Uh, and so the idea of being in this, in this place I romanticize it now, and I go back to what I said. There was real poverty. People were hungry. People came to school. In, they had made plimsolls at the door for people who couldn't have shoes. So they picked the pairs that fitted, and they stayed at the school. There was really serious stuff going on. But there, also, there was a glow about it. There was helping each other. There was the, the poorest streets would join in. The, the, the big carnivals that we did, we were, we were great at carnivals and so on. So I have a great recollection of a tremendous, tremendous, cohesive working class culture, which was, I think, this country is its best. And the National Health Service came in just after the war, and that made it even better. And what I find amazing is that your parents had so many siblings, and yet they only had you. And so you grew up as a lone child. How was that? Well, I've been trying to fathom that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> had they had enough, I don't know. <laughs> the I was, one golden <laughs> egg <laughs> was laid. <laughs> I was born just after the war started. So my father went off and came back about 1945 when I was about six or seven. I've written about it in a book called The Soldier's Return. And he was a stranger uh, to me. Uh, my mother basically brought me up in this odd house where I was in, in the nicest possible way. And I mean that. And what I'm going to say also mean I was lied to all the time. Because this aunt and that uncle were no relation to me at all. There were other foster people. This cousin was not my cousin. That grandmother was not my mother's mother. And so, this, but it was all insisted that this was a perfectly normal family, and we were all intimately related. No, no, we weren't at all. So it, I think that had a peculiar effect on me. Not a damaging effect. Not a dangerous effect. It was a cosseting effect. Those that are keeping me away from things and. And I think that was what happened in my childhood, especially in my mother, who, I mean, to be, she was illegitimate. She was, she was illegitimate. Now, in that town, town at that time, um, when she was born uh, at the end, of the, uh, the end of the First World War, to be illegitimate was a scar. <coughs> it was a terrible thing. And one of two things happened. Either the mother had to leave the town, or the daughter had to be shuffled out of the town, or shuffled into a foster home. My mother's mother had to, was forced to leave the town. And she went across the border into Scotland. We were on the border of Scotland. And my mother, as I say, was fostered by a woman called Mrs. Gilbertson, who fostered several children. And she was a very nice woman. I remember her very well. She was a very kind woman. Um, so, but, but what I'm saying now is that it was important to her that I never put my head above the parapet that we stayed under because she didn't want people to say his mother was... That's right, or start pointing yeah. the finger and yeah. making accusations. <laughs> and whenever, whenever I got above myself, which is a phrase of Albert <laughs> if I got above myself, she slushed me off at the knees like nobody I've ever known before <laughs> or since. She really was deadly. <laughs> Do you think then that's, that's why you've actually kept a very, very just personable... Um, you're not arrogant at all, or maybe, I don't know you enough, maybe you're very arrogant <laughs> for all I know, but, you know, you, you come across very personable, just very down-to-earth, very kind, and everything I've read about you, you, you know, you speak out for truth and art and reality and authenticity all the time. Do you think that's where that kind of comes from, having somebody who, who kept you always mindful of what really mattered? Yeah, they were very decent people. They were very good parents. They're very, very decent people. And I had a slight difficulty with relationship with my father at the beginning, because who was he? Um, this man who suddenly came over and, and he was more important in my mother's life than, than I was. I mean, how dare he be? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't in the script. <laughs> and uh, but then that settled down. Um, they were both extremely hard workers. I yeah. mean, they never didn't have two jobs. 
that's right. Uh, my mother worked on the post as well as cle she cleaned houses after she got fired <laughs> for being married. <laughs> she cleaned other people's houses and worked on the post in a very early round in the morning. Wow. Uh, my dad worked at the factory and then he worked in a pub in the evening to make extra to make extra cash. So. And that's why you lived above. We, when we got the pub, so, we lived a little flat above the pub. Yeah. And so you spent a lot of your time, your childhood, alone upstairs because your parents yeah. would be downstairs yeah. working. And so is that when you then started to entertain books? Because I know you started to read from the age of four. Yeah. I think lonely, only, only children. I wasn't a lonely child. I, I suppose I'm... I just, you know the condition you are as a child, don't you? Your childhood, you think, well, that's everybody's childhood. And of course it isn't. It's only when you get older that you realise different people <laughs> have different childhoods. I thought that was the way it was. I was left on my own a lot. I had pals all around the town. But I started to read very early. Because of the war, I went to school when I was four. Because if your father was in the forces, they took you to school earlier so that the mothers could get back into the workforce. So that was a good start, and we had very good primary school. Miss Imanson taught us <laughs> <laughs> on the wall there. A huge, huge, massive print of God. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> a long white beard. <laughs> I said, no messing about with Miss Imanson. <laughs> I think she made it very clear her position <laughs> yes, in that classroom. Exactly. And she taught us how to read and write and tie our shoelaces. Oh, how fantastic. <laughs> and, and you see, you always remember her for that, oh, yeah. right? I can remember all the women in that, that first. There were six, six classes in that little school, and all women. Their husbands were away, or in one case had been killed in the First World War. Right. And then you went off to university as you, you grew up. You went off to university. You went to one of the colleges in Oxford. And that, again, was an opportunity that came to you, right? It wasn't that it was your rite of passage. It was that an opportunity arose and you were able to go into university. Because that was a time when, every, like, you know, like it's common now for everybody to go to university. And when you were going to university, that wasn't common at all. No, it was about 4% of the population went to university, and I did. And I only discovered four years ago how lucky I was. My school teacher, my history teacher, Mr. James, who had been a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War, therefore a hero, um, he told me, but they did a film about me, and I went to talk to Mr. James. And he'd never told me this, and nor had my parents told me this. Uh, and I was, it was astonishing. He said, you know, I had to go and talk to Stan and Ethel three times to persuade them that you could stay on at school. Wow. And... And I, I, was, I wasn't shocked or anything, but I was put it mildly surprised. And I, I think I said something like, why? Because my dad was a clever man, as I've said. But, and he said, he, he didn't, I told him you, were okay, you could do it academically. But my father said, I don't know whether he's going to enjoy being with other people and going to university. I don't know whether that's the, I don't know whether that's the life he'll want. Uh, and my mother was very quiet, but she, of course, quite naturally, didn't want me to leave Whitton. And frankly, neither did I. I was having a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was approaching the age of having a proper girlfriend, which meant I saw more than twice. <laughs> 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 and, and anyway, he persuaded them to let me stay on. And then the funny thing was, for me, and the, the remarkable thing was for me, and the, as my father, who was a really clever man, decided that every friend I'd got in the formula, every boyfriend, every boy friend, every friend of mine who was a boy in that class, it was a big school, left, except me. They, they, were, they went back, they worked, a lot of them went back to work on the farm, or they went to work in factories or wherever it was. And, um, and my father worked out that I wouldn't have enough money to keep up with them for the essentials in life, like going to the dance on Saturday night. Uh, and um, so he gave me jobs to do. And there were serious jobs. I mean, every morning I had to sweep. We had a front, quite a big front, easily as big as that patio. I had to clean that every morning, sweep it. I had to swill out the gents' loos. I had to bring up beer from the cellar in these cases and put them on the, on the shelves. It shows you what an age it was. <laughs> put the bottles of beer on shelves which are under the bar counter so nobody could see them, but still I had to wipe every bottle clean. <laughs> from front and back. <laughs> So I did that before I went to school and various other things, which meant I was doing some sort of proper work, which you gave me, I got as much pocket money as the others did after they'd paid their parents. 
So I, I felt okay about that. And then I just, I like reading, and I just, I, thought, yeah, I must have clicked in somewhere that this was a job, and I'd better get on with it. So I worked excessively hard. I mean, I would do about four or five hours homework a night. Wow. Uh, every night, except uh, I would do no work on Saturday, and even more work on Sunday between church, between going to church. Partly, I just loved it. I loved sitting there reading and reading and reading, and that was it. And, uh, and then you got better at it, and because you, got be you get better at something, you do more of it, don't you? Right, right. But you know, I get this sense, and I'm reading about you and following your life, that you were born before your time. It's like you were born for now. And some of your experience, I, I explain what I mean, because I know it sounds a little bit crazy. Don't look at me like that. Hugh, <laughs> he's looking at me like frowning. Um, <laughs> it's like some of the experiences that you went through and how you addressed those experiences are what we're now trying to teach people in society. Like, it's, I hope you don't mind us talking very briefly. We don't have to go into it too much. But I know that you yourself suffered two mental breakdowns. And yet your approach to them and how you dealt with them was very holistic. And you, you moved to the arts more and you moved to reading and you moved, you found a place of rest. Now, we're talking, this is back in the like, 50s when you had your first one. We weren't talking about <laughs> dealing with mental health in those terms then. We talk about it now and it's very normal to talk about it normal. But... Back then, it would be much more you go into some kind of institution because you're not coping and you get um, stigmatized and, uh, you know, labeled. And yet you took a completely different route to it. And this is what I mean about... And, and there's more I want to talk about that. I feel like, literally, you were born for today. And I think it feels like your voice is going to be stronger today. And anyway... I'm not going to keep talking like that, but tell it, can you talk a little bit about how you found your way through um, well, the that first, first... The first breakdown I had was when I was about 13 or 14. I didn't know it was a breakdown. We didn't... <laughs> I didn't know if we knew, anybody had ever had a breakdown or talked about a breakdown. You're talking about 1952, 1953 here, uh, and it was... I was... I was very frightened for about a year, year and a half. And to be brief, it took the form of me feeling that something was going out of my mind, especially at night, and in that corner, there would be a white light, little white light, light, white light. And there was this thing watching it, and this thing wasn't really me, that light was me. And if it didn't come back, I was in a lot of trouble. And you just had to stay there. Uh, and then it got worse because whenever I, uh, it, when my mind began to sort of slip out of itself, if I passed a window in the street going up to school and you caught a glimpse of yourself, slip. and uh, the problem was that there was nobody on earth I could talk to. I mean, I prayed a lot, but there's nothing, nobody on earth I could talk to because I was embarrassed, because I didn't know what it was, because what words were that, I mean, I find it difficult to talk about now. And I'm 79 now, but then when I was, what, was I 13 or something? I didn't have the words. You couldn't go to a doctor. You don't, I mean, my mother used to dress up to go to a doctor to prove that she was okay, and it was ridiculous. <laughs> so, <laughs> going to a doctor... <laughs> she did, yeah, I've got to believe me. <laughs> and uh, her main thing when I said I had an ache or a pain, she, was, she looked me straight in the eye and said, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and that was that. That was the doctor we got. It was great. But I, so I didn't know what to do, and, and it suffered everything. I was quite good at school, but I'd slip from the A stream right down to the B, then to the C stream. I couldn't concentrate on anything. Um, it was awful. Uh, I think what pulled it through is what you're suggesting. I think that was when I started getting more and more interested, not just in reading, but in learning. And I just, i tell you what it did, I think, what it did was by concentrating on learning things that I wanted to know about, like things in the arts, which were way foreign to me. We didn't have an opera house in any of all. I blocked out the other stuff because I was so interested in it that it blocked out. It blocked it out. Uh, I think a lot of people find that when, they, when they're in distress. By concentrating on something else, you block out what's bothering you. 
without knowing that's where I found myself going to. And I, that's one of the reasons I worked so hard. I said five hours a night, I mean it. But because that was great, because I didn't have to think of anything else except what was in the book. Right. Uh, what I was trying to write that was in the book. And he blocked it out. So you're right in that way. And the other one happened at the end of my first marriage when my first wife took her own life. And I was uh, all over the place. And it wasn't as severe as the first time, but it was, it was, a, it was a, what they call the clinical depression. She, we were both clinically depressed. It was a pretty awful time. Uh, and I pulled through that. I'd got, by that time, I'd published two or three books and so on. So I had things to lean on. But the first one was just terrifying. I just tell you, I know anybody, and then I became president of mine for 15 years uh, and, uh, and worked with them and still work with them. <laughs> Steve, Stephen's the president now, but he's often in America, uh, Stephen Fry. So I do a lot of stuff still here, basically fundraising and going to talk to people and that sort of thing. And my story is that you can come through it. Right. Uh, that's the story. And that's the story that's developed over the last uh, what, years. Well, when did I started working with mine 25 years ago, more than that. Anyway, the, the people can, because when I was a, a kid younger, first of, most people didn't know what it was. Uh, I mean, look after the war. Look at the traumas that people from all those people in the war, from the whole country, look at the traumas they suffered. There was hardly any recognition of it. Nobody said, we've got to help you through this, we've got to nurse you through this. People said, the best thing you can do is get back to work. That was about what happened. Nobody realized that. So the realization, if you broke a little finger, people said, oh dear. If you're going, literally, if you're in your mind, people said, what's wrong with you? Right. And it was a very, it was a wall, a wall of ignorance, which was an innocent ignorance. People weren't being prejudiced. They just didn't understand it. They didn't take it seriously. They didn't think it mattered because there wasn't a physical sign of it. And it, but we all know that inside our minds we can be more tormented than we are by a broken arm, much yes. more, and yes. so on. Exactly. And it was that thing that we tried to push mind towards, and I think we made a lot of progress. No, absolutely, absolutely. And going, I'm sorry to be dwelling so long in your childhood, but it defines so much of the man you are today and who sits before us. Um, you were like around four years old when your eyesight started to get really bad. And so then you had to start wearing glasses. And then because of that, you had this um, wonderful thing where you just wanted to read everything because you wanted to still prove almost that you could still read and you could still see. Was that where your love of the written word came from? Because to say you have a passion for the written word is an understatement. Uh, I mean, it's evident. Even if you don't realize it, it is evident <laughs> that you have this passion, this living passion, you live, breathe the written word in all its forms. So do you think that 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 um, almost losing your sight, that the fear of losing your sight when you were so young has festered that? I think you, I think I might have concentrated it because <clears throat> um, indoors became safer than outdoors for a while. Uh, and it was as simple as that. Um, <laughs> We played a lot of sport when we were kids. I mean, we were the sort of kids who played football in the dark. We were, we were obsessed by it. Uh, and the football wasn't necessarily football. It was anything round you could kick. Uh, <laughs> if you get dark on a summer evening, you'd still be playing football. And <laughs> the football, we thought it was there. And in fact, it was over there. But it was a bit worse than that for me, because I really didn't know. <laughs> And Just it was worse cricket. anything round. <laughs> I, loved, I loved cricket. I loved watching cricket. But I couldn't see the ball <laughs> come and there would be, oops, hello, hello. <laughs> so so I, think I had to give up. My cricketing career was oh. <laughs> short and disastrous. It's a shame. I still I love watching it. I can't understand that I can see this damn thing hurtling at them. <laughs> I can't see, even see it in slow motion. Oh, that's too funny. That's too funny. So, because, like, from the age of 16, you actually started to write. Yeah. But then you went into broadcasting bec only because the, the, the BBC trainee programme offered you a position, and you were, like, one of two who got a position. Yeah, they gave two what they called general traineeships a year in those days. They basically went to public schools. 
and these are the future director generals. Uh, but I'd, I'd done a few things at Oxford. Oxford was, when I got there, I mean, the terrible thing is that I was homesick. The terrible thing is that my girlfriend couldn't come with me because she, <laughs> she'd started working in a proper job when she was 16. But still, I used to hitch up every other weekend. I met a guy who drove a lorry at a roundabout just outside Oxford, and he took me up to Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> and from Wigan, I was on my own. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> it was all right. And it was fine, actually. He was a very nice man. And um, so at Oxford, after the first year or so, when I did the things I'd done at school, I could still play rugby because you didn't have to. Especially if you're in the forwards, this big thing comes at you. And we were such a little school that if you played rugby at all, you were in the team because there weren't enough to do in the team. And I was in the choir, so that's two sets of friends you got. It was a strange existence because I'd, I'd been at a mixed school, and this was a uh, men's college. When I went, there was, uh, I think it was 28 men's colleges and three women's colleges, uh, and there were all strict rules about this, that, and the other and you ate in communal dining rooms and all that. It didn't take a lot of getting used to. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. Um, uh, so there was that. And the, the, the people there, the men there, some of them were nice, some of them weren't. It's like yeah, the, some of them were snobbish. I thought they were very funny. I mean, all right, just ignore them, for God's sake. What's the, why waste your time? Um, and some of them were very pleasant. A couple of them were friends I made then, and they've been friends ever since. So it was, it yeah. was easy in that sense. Well, it was, it was, I was a bit home. Uh, but I did things, to come to the point, not waste your time. What Oxford allowed me to do was things I never dreamed of being able to do at school. Right. For instance, there was a film society. So I joined, I was mad on going to films uh, when I was a kid. And because we had a little pub and we put a poster up, done by Tommy Jackson, he hand, hand did the posters every week. Uh, and we had one in our pub. We got complimentary tickets. So I could not only go to Saturday matinees, but I could go through the week with a pal. You got two compliments. <laughs> if my mother didn't take them first, but still, that's all right. <laughs> but she was working in the pub most of the time as well. So, but I went, there was a cinema club, and I discovered foreign films. I discovered Bergman and Pellini, and then all those people I went on later to interview. It was extraordinary. Uh, and I thought, I'd, I'd only gone to films to see film stars. I'd never gone to see the work of a director or a writer or anything like that. But then I discovered this. I discovered that. So that was that. I acted and went round, got in a company, in undergraduate company. We toured Germany with the Shakespeare plays, and I did that. I wrote for the what's it called magazine, the Charwell, the Oxford magazine, and did that. So there were lots of stuff that I did. So when I went up for this interview, I'd gone into the short list of nine for about three hundred, and I. I I didn't really care what I did. I wanted, you've got to believe me, I didn't. I thought, well, I don't know, something will turn up. I tried to be a workers' education authority lecturer, and I, I failed that. I was turned down. Uh, I miffed at that, but anyway, I was turned down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going to be a great job because it didn't really start till 5 o'clock in the afternoon when people turned up, so I had the day to myself to write. I think maybe, unfortunately, I told that to, <laughs> 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 to the people who were asking <laughs> about the job. <laughs> I've thought about that ever since and thinking that wasn't quite the best way yeah, to present, you present you know, yourself. And I got on this thing, I fluked in, and two things happened at that interview, which I'll never forget. One was, I always had a book with me, and I was, a, I suppose, a bit excited about going to London for this thing, and I'd rushed out. I didn't have a book, so I got a paper on the station, uh, and I read the paper very thoroughly. That's one thing. The other thing was that the board, which was about five or six people, one of the people was ill, so the substitution was a man uh, who, uh, Martin, Martin Grossman, who was a drama producer in the BBC. He was, a, he was Jewish, he'd come over, his family had come over in the 20s and 30s. And he was very grumpy, he didn't want to be on this thing. Um, and I learned afterwards, you learn these things afterwards, two things. In the, in the, the, the guy, <laughs> I'm just sorry about this. The guy was con the interview was conducted by a man, I don't, won't mention his name, but he was very, very upper in those days of the world. And he, his skin was, <laughs> he wore silk because his skin was so fair that only silk could, boom, 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 all of <laughs> them. 
<laughs> I mean, the, the fibs they tell themselves, and you believe it. Anyway, so I, was, I wasn't doing great. And then he asked, and he, they always give you a corker question. I was doing a, his corker question was, and what about the situation in Albania at the moment? <laughs> well, I'd read the same article in the Times that he'd read that morning. Oh, <laughs> yay, yay. <laughs> That's really true. And because I was a bit faster on my feet than he was, I said, oh, well, situation in Albania. What you've got to remember, I'm more or less parroted it because he used to have a quite a good memory. And he looked absolutely fed up to the back teeth. <laughs> Martin over there on the right, who'd been scribbling his own stuff, just wanting to get out of this business, perked up and, and asked me some questions about Joyce and Beckett and people I'd read. Well, I did history at the University of it. And we chatted away quite a bit. And he told me afterwards, all right, Mr. James, I will met you in the canteen. He said, they didn't want you, you know. They didn't want grammar school boys. He said, but I'd, I'd, they dragged me out of the studio and I was sitting there. He said, I was damned. I was going to get my own way once. <laughs> <laughs> so someone um, fought for you. That was a fluke. Yeah. Isn't that that was a fluke. I mean, flukes in life, a lot of your listeners are like, Bumping into somebody, having an accidental meeting, mm. these sort of things matter far more than they should, but they do. They, they really do. do. Or having a sister or a brother, or whatever it is, there's something that put you in the right direction. There's so many directions to go in. There's a wonderful poem by Robert Frost about the path not taken. You didn't go that way, you went that way. If you caught that bus, if you hadn't done that bus, you'd have done something else. If you met that person earlier, you'd have done... Well, there are hundreds of those all the way along your life. And some you don't even notice, and some you look back and say, but if I'd only done that, you miss. And some go click, and you click into something that stays with you. And that click, joining the BBC, changed my life. I never, I started to make arts programmes, which I've now done for, I don't know, more than 40 years. I didn't think you could make a living doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't think you were allowed to make a living. <laughs> right, right. You've done the first of many things in your careers. And it's like, every, it's almost like you have the Midas touch. Everything you, you uh, uh, approach and work on, it just grows life and takes substance. And it, it's like, it's not that you're doing it with a, a motive of money. I mean, I'm saying this because I've researched him for like a month now. And it's like, there's nothing, there's no article. There's nothing about you that was attached with, oh, money and how much he's getting paid or all of this. It's, it's always about just the sheer, Marvin Bragg said, we should be doing this. And so he started to do this. You know what I mean? It's like you see a need that like with the arts, with the, the South Bank show. You, was, you were saying, no, it's really important that art is available for everybody. Yeah. It shouldn't just be for the elite. We need to make this more accessible. And so, bang, comes the South Bank show, and bang, comes Radio 4, and bang, comes all of your books. It's like, it's like you, your passions run so deeply that they, they, they push through the barriers. How? <laughs> you know um, what I mean? I mean, are you aware that this is happening? Well, I am to a certain extent. You're being very flattering, and we're not very <laughs> we're not very good at taking flattery in, in, the north, <laughs> in the north of England. I'm completely unused to it. It's embarrassing, but it's nice all the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't stop being embarrassed, but you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> you learn to adapt to my flattery. What then. I was absolutely convinced of was two things, like a lot of things, and you get a chance. I was saying the path not taken is that people I, the people that, that I was brought up with, we were, they, were, they, were, they were good, we had very good choirs. We had a very good town, but there were competitions between the towns, and we had very good town choir, school choir, church choir. Uh, there were, and I said there were 12 churches and chapels. We competed in the town itself. So we knew about music. We didn't know about music in the sense of playing in orchestra. We knew about music. We had our little dramatic society. So we knew about, but the big things, passed us by. There was no nearby opera house, there was no nearby orchestra, there was no nearby great theatre, those things. Not. And also, there was a terrible hierarchy. As there was in England, as there still is to some extent in England, and it's no good. And the idea was that anything put on at the Royal Opera House was great because it was at the Royal Opera House. Anything done as a musical or a show was, or a, an American musical, I thought American musicals were, well, it's all right, but it wasn't really art. Art was at the Royal Opera House, even though some of it was poor. 
and second race and derivative. And the mu music, American musicals were fantastic. You know, Singing in the Rain, it's a wonderful piece of work. And on we go. So I was aware of that. And when I got a chance, when I got my own television programme, I did, a <laughs> I did something which is very stupid, but it worked out OK. The stupid thing when you get anything new in public service is to write a manifesto. Why it's stupid <laughs> is because everybody picks it up and says, he didn't do that, he didn't do that. <laughs> I can see Jeremy Corbyn's problem as we're sitting here now. Right, 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 <laughs> He's right. thinking, no, I can't put it. And my manifesto was quite simple. It was that the culture that came from ordinary people was totally undervalued. It seemed to me that television was regarded as down there and the stage was up there. But I was seeing some drama on television that was far better than anything I saw in those. I knew it was better. It was better acted, better directed, better... It was just better. And why wasn't it getting its due? The music... I, I, I like classical music. I, I, uh, but the popular music was coming through from all over the world, and it was, it was extraordinary. And people said, oh, well, that's pop music. Put it on top of the pops and with a few girls dancing around. That would... No, you examine it in the same way as you examine classical music. You examine television drama in the same way you examine no drama. You, um, you examine comedians in the same way you examine uh, opera singers. You did that all the way through. And it's a new mix. I mean, in a way, we had a pyramid. We have pyramids. We like pyramids. We're a pyramid hierarchical society. In many ways, we still are. I didn't want a pyramid. I wanted a rainbow. Because I wanted to say, quality is found all over the place. You can't say equality is there because of the place in the social order. Remember, the, the novel, when it started, was derided. It was thought to be rubbish. Films, when they started, oh, flicks, they were called. They'll never last. Derided. Now it's one of the great art forms. Television, oh, the, the box in the Kong, or the Google box, that was derided. Now, fantastic stuff on television. They're always wrong. The people who build on the past, that's the first thing. Is, so we started to do that in a big way. And they gave me, uh, they gave me a lot of programmes and I got a team around me. I had to go... <laughs> it was a kilometre start because of that damn manifesto. And also, I'll never forget, the reviews, the first programme was determined to do the Beatles. I thought, these, these, this music is going to last and it's great and I love it, so we're going to make it. It was a major arts programme. ITV was very proud of themselves. So we're starting with the Beatles. And I wanted to get hold of McCartney, because John is dead. And he was very upset because of the row with, that he'd been having, that he'd had with the splitting up with John and, uh, and it ever. But eventually, through a pal, through a pal, I, I didn't get to him, but he, well, we went and chatted and he came and did an interview. And he was charming and, and brilliant. And he's, I think I agree with Bob Dylan. I think he's a sort of genius. And we started with him. Well... You'd think I started by pulling a body, dead body out of a sewer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember getting, I mean, the Daily Telegraph, huge thing. Um, we welcome the fact that there's a new arts program on ITV, which is going to, we deplore the fact, we, we cannot, but we draw the line, we draw the line <laughs> at the Beatles. <laughs> And you think now, 40, 50 years on, I mean, the this Beatles is music is operas, it's ballets. <laughs> and you. I would like to say to that critic, which, which classical music in the, in the six, 1960s by British has lasted as long as their music has lasted? Right. And popular music all over the place is just powerful. So I'm very pleased to be part of that. Yes, and because, you know, everything you're saying sounds very normal to us now in the 21st century. But we're talking, this is a man who was talking like this back in the 50s, late 40s, 50s, when people weren't talking this way. You have this amazing ability to look sideways and to see much wide, broader. So, I mean, there were so many, and I know people have got questions, and I know the time's running out, and I know Kofi, the owner of Colourful Radio, has just said we can go extra time. So we're going to go a little bit extra time because I still have questions. We need to get to your books. 24 fiction books, 12 non-fiction books, and these are the only ones that we see. Because I, I know authors, and I know authors always have their pile that no one sees, the, the poems, the stories, the essays, the, the journals, the, the books that you never, ever actually put out there. So the ones that we've actually get to see, 
24 fictions, 12 non-fiction. You've, you're a man with something to say. I mean, right? You've, you, you are a man with something to say. What are you saying to us? You remind me of John the Baptist. You really do. Again, because that's another thing I want to talk about. You, you, <laughs> this is a man who defends the Bible. You're known for defending the King James Version of the Bible. And yet, are you even a believer? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Sorry. Uh, so, I'm asking no, all your no, questions no, in one hit. No, I am no, so sorry. A, I mean, it's just lovely talking to you. It's lovely being here. Oh, thank uh, you. The, the key to it is that I am in the, in, I am in the seriously lucky position of doing what I love to do all the time. I stumbled on it. I worked for it. It was an accident. And then it was determined. Or for all those things, we can. I do what I want. So the art for writing is something I love doing, even if I don't do any writing like that. I'm thinking about writing, and the television is just a joy working with other people. So that's the first thing. And I've always thought that if you do what you want to do, that gives you strength. I was brought up surrounded by a lot of people who were not doing what they wanted to do, and it tired them. They were often physically tired. The men were doing physical jobs. We're talking about laboring, we're talking about coal mines, we're talking about digging roads up, and it was tiring. But it was also tiring in there, in their minds, because they were, they were pushing against the resistance to doing it. They didn't want to do those jobs. They knew they were awful jobs. They knew they were bottom of the ladder jobs. Um, but they had to do them to make income, to make a wage. So I think when you're doing something, you just, I just feel relief and privilege. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, yeah, I have to say, I mean, when I started to write novels, I wanted to put my sort of background on the map. There were certain novels written about the working classes in the north, but not many, and, and I wanted to have my version of it. Uh, and I went through that. Uh, so that was one of the reasons I just wanted to write that out, say, look, we were here too. We we're there. We, you, you don't find, we're not in Jane Austen's novels. Uh, you don't see them. We're, we're an absent servant there, but actually, <laughs> my father's sisters were real servants. <laughs> How about that? So, that, so there was that. And then I got interested in things. And turned, I mean, religion, which let's take that as one, because I've written about science. I was brought up a very, in a very, um, very powerful Christian town. You talk of a town of 5,000 people with 12 different places of worship, churches and chapels. It's a lot. And Sunday was like a tomb. Um, <laughs> except inside the tomb itself. But the rest of the day, the rest of the week, as I said earlier, things were going on. Um, and you take that in. I mean, Freud, I think, I think he's very suspect, actually. Words was more interesting. You said the same thing, that the child is father of the man, and that by the time you're a certain age, you're there, and you know with your own kids, don't you? you think, oh, he was always like that. Even when they're 37, they don't want you to tell them <laughs> you were always like that. Oh, she was always a bit like that. <laughs> and that's it. When in my childhood, my mother's fiction was the town. What happened in the town was her story. And, and, and she knew everybody. And we, we didn't have fridges in that. They said, the fridge didn't have phone, didn't have car. It doesn't matter. We didn't listen because nobody else said, anyway, we didn't listen. But you used to shop for the meal. And you said, would you go out and get something for tea or whatever it was? And you'd go up to Virginia's and come and get it. And the first thing was, who did you see? And I said, and I was a little reporter. I mean, I, <laughs> I should, I should, exactly, I should be our, our country reporter, really. I was always, who did you see? Well, where was she going? Well, who was she with? <laughs> was she with her daughter? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I've got some. Then what is it? <laughs> And it was all the time. It was much more subtly done than that, but it was relentless. Um, and so she, the town was, was the fiction that she built up. Uh, and, and so that, I, I suppose I got the idea of, of stories, and I sort of like imitating people, so there was a bit of that from that. I've, slightly, I've lost my drift. The working and doing a lot, I wanted to put my lot on the map. Not on the map, I mean. I'm, and that's a big pretentious thing. So just say, we were here too. Yes. You know, we were here. And actually, I felt that the same about pop music. Hold on, we're very important. Hold on, 
The greatest revolution that the world has ever seen is, in my view, is the Industrial Revolution. Far bigger and far more effective than the French Revolution or the Chinese Revolution or Mao or even Stalin. What happened in the north of England in that time of the Industrial Revolution that we completely changed the world? You look at the population growth, it goes ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -dum for about 8,000 years, then it goes zoom because of the Industrial Revolution. You look about, now it had bad sides and bad sides, but it had massively good sides, bringing energy, bringing wealth, bringing cities, brought all that sort of thing. To, uh, and, uh, and so I wanted to sort of put, uh, and we did it. It's always, oh, it's like this bloke. You can't, <laughs> you can't believe the ownership that the upper classes have on this country. There's this fellow on his land is discovered, underneath his land, there's discovered this great Roman mosaic. Um, I mean, you won't let us look at it because it's his. Well, it isn't his. It's under a bit of grass that he put on. But he takes it for granted, oh, he, I found it on my estate. No, he didn't. Somebody who was digging in the garden found it on his estate. But they get no credit. Just like in Cumberland, uh, on the west coast of Cumberland, well, that's where the ships came in to bring all the precious goods for the Roman wall in the, in the second and third century. And the great pits, deposit pits, where they put them in, and they covered them up when they left because they thought they were coming back. Inside that, they found all sorts of things, Roman altars and so And there was a massive find about 10 years ago of stuff. Like that. And the chap said, well, on my land, I found such and such. No, he didn't. There were three blokes in the field, and they were digging something, and they came across something, and they dug carefully around it, and they discovered it was a Roman altar. And then they discovered another one. They found it. But they get no credit ever. Wow. I don't know why this is taking me, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Part of your passion. But you know what? We are going to talk about your book. But before we do that, don't worry about I it. do I'm need fine. to open it up because I have no doubt that just you talking and sharing, it's probably prompted some questions from people. So if anyone has a question, um, if they want to just raise their hand or a comment or a thought, yes. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for talking to us. For your, um, looking back on your career, obviously it's, it's spanned several years, and there are occasions where you got dissed by the Daily Telegraph for talking about the Beatles. I was wondering if there is a massive I told you so that you've been sitting on all these years that you'd like to get off your chest and just share with us to say, I was always right about that, and now I've been proved right. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> when you get your own back, by keeping on doing it. <laughs> and then you see other people doing it, and now it's taken for granted. Yeah. And you think, yeah, that was good. We were there when something happened, and we were a little part of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, it wasn't nice at the start. And also there's the class thing. Let's, uh, let's, let's be honest about it. There's not... <laughs> the upper class of the middle have never been welcoming to working class artists. Uh, they have to... They've never been welcoming. They step, to a certain extent, it's opening up a bit now. I'd be surprised how much it is as well. So there's that as well. I, I, it doesn't bother me, but it's there. And partly because they don't want to know what's going on. If you're a friend of mine is Clive Jones from Australia, he's a brilliant man. He comes from a background rather like my own, he's a writer and a poet and so uh, Now they're much more interested in anybody from Australia than they are from anybody in Warrington. Because they don't like English working class people getting out of the <laughs> When you look back on our history, the fight to get ordinary things, the fight to get the vote, the fight for women to get the vote, the fight to get decent housing. It seems incredible when you're back. Why did it take so long? Why was it always a fight? Because they felt they could keep suppressing people, and they were very good at it. The stratagems, the tax systems, and all sorts of laws, and all, they were very good at it. And breaking through that is still going on. And it must go on further, in my view. Um, so so the, there was that going on as well all the time. You just you somehow have to show you it. It's, it's a different, you see, if you've been to public schools, I'm not, I don't know quite what you've been in public schools, men and women, it's a different attitude of mind. Some people are absolutely 10 out of 10. They have 22 characters, they do good things and rights, but that's, that's not a problem. 
But it's the, well, there isn't a problem, but it's a difference, the ethos of difference. The sense of privilege is different. You go to school when you're studying to a school, the privileged school, and you keep that privileged school when you're 18, then you go to a privileged university, then you go to the ends of You're a different person from those people who go to an ordinary school, go to a national school, or even work in it. You're a different person. You have different connections with people. And I don't think that the working class connections are particularly um, welcome. I think they're welcome if they're slightly uh, mocked. Uh, but I don't think they're welcome if they're trying to do something which is <coughs> a certain word, <coughs> excuse me, what we used to call a bum there station. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just have to get on, keep doing it. That's awesome. Question. Two questions I have for you, um, Melvin. I was, yeah, sorry. Yeah, here your program topic or title on cause the Merlin Bride. I don't always listen to it because it clashes to my Christian program, which I sorry about that to say to you, I prefer to listen to. But now and again I listen to you. And I wonder it is a cross board of all knowledge. Where do you get that sort of detail from? Uh -huh. Second question is, are you a Christian, a believer? Well, uh question is a big one. The first one, in our time on Thursday mornings is um <coughs> is um we do subjects that interest me. I mean, so it's either Chinese history or the history of teeth, or tomorrow morning we do the next one, the Gordon Riots, the biggest riots in England, in, in England probably in the last 300 years, in the 1780s. Um, 700 people were shot in London, in this city, by the army, unarmed people. They had the help. They were bringing a petition to Parliament uh, about Catholic emancipation. Uh, that's not our missile, this is here. Uh, and they were typified as the mob and so on, and they weren't, they were artisans and what were called sober working class citizens. We erased that sort of thing. I read a book about the uh, Peasants' Revolt, so-called Peasants' Revolt in 30 years. They weren't peasants. Some of them were, were around, there were a lot of ordinary people involved who did not have, were disenfranchised. They couldn't vote or anything, but their way was to sort of demonstrate their positions. They were, a lot of them were murdered as well. So. Uh, so you take subjects, different subjects. I just like going out. I like science. I don't know much about it, but I know we always talk to very, to brilliant people and bring it to a huge audience now. Our little program now goes all around the world. Next to uh, BBC Global News, it's the most successful app of the BBC. Yeah? And all we're doing, all I'm doing, is saying, look, this is a, this is something string theory or uh, whatever it is. All the like. Shakespeare, a Shakespeare play we did a couple of weeks ago. This is what's going to happen, and they say, and we try to, I try to drive it, and that's the first thing. Am I still a Christian? I, in the sense that you mean it, I, 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 my answer would have to be no. In the sense that I mean it, I think that the idea of there being a mystery has never left me. The idea of there being a mystery in things. I find it, I find, and I believe that totally until I was about 16 or 17, and, it, I, and then I started bringing in the great weapon of reason and thinking, well, I don't, they, they can't, can there be a resurrection? What, what, when I look at any laws of physics, and can, can there be a resurrection? Um, it's a different belief system. So why belief. don't you start from, can it be God? That's the question I want well, to ask. Well, I think, I can't. Can it be God? I think, there can be a, God? I think there can be a God, but I don't think he's a man with a long white beard. I think that there is something that started this, and it might surprise you this, that it seems to me that if we started from the 13 and a half billion years ago, the Big Bang, I don't think we necessarily started from that. I think that was the end of something as well as the beginning of something. Inside that tiny, tiny thing, half as big as one's finger now, the whole universe has come. Now that's an intelligence, it seems to me. So therefore, inside that was an intelligence. An intelligence that we don't yet know about don't know how it operates. But that intelligence is the mystery of life. And inside that mystery of life is what people have called God, they've called Yahweh, they've worshipped mountains, they've worshipped trees. Inside, in that sort of God, that sort of instigator, uh, I think is there, yes. I also think the second, the other side of the New Testament particularly, the moral side is probably, I think the Sermon on the Mount is probably the, the, best, the most authoritative, important piece of work written by anyone about how we should live our lives. 
But I'm writing about I'm writing about the seven on the nine. You feel that? So that I take on board completely. Um, I just find it difficult to. I just find it difficult to. Well, well, I think the Christian religion, which is the one I know, is marvelous in many ways. It's terrible in many ways. But religion is always used by people, abused by people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is abused by people all the time. Somebody wanted to claim they want to go and conquer that bit of the south of France. Uh, uh, um, and they'll say, oh, I'm doing this in the name of God, which mm. gives it a sort of nobility and a, a justification. But it's really just a power play. It's to do with power, not with religion. And power is seized on religion all the time. Or it's created its own religion. I mean, Mao created his own religion, Maoism. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge question. And I, I've stumbled towards giving you an answer, but I'm afraid that's it's the best I can do. I'll see you after, man. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. Are there any more questions? Oh, OK, we'll come here at the back, and then we'll finish with Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been an amazing interview. Um, the question I want to ask, I suppose, what I've gleaned from listening to you talking is that you are, I suppose, you're what, working class and a historian, but it sounds like you also are conflicted about, uh, I suppose, society and like how we've lived, even in that story, talking about the 1780s and riots and stuff. And so I suppose my question is, how does your position now as a lord within a system that is based on repression and suppression like, <laughs> sit with you as a working class historian? I think that the, uh, I went into the lords because Blair invited me a couple of times and what, for a very specific reason that the, the Blair government wanted to push through a big reform of arts funding which was a bit of a, and there were very few people, I think there's only one person in the House of Lords who could help to drive it through. So he asked a few of us, David Putnam, uh, about three or four of us, Wahid Ali, who knew a bit about it, to go in and drive that through, help to drive it through, which we did. Um, it was a strange thing to do, to be in the Lords. On the other hand, the Lords is full of trade unionists, uh, former trade unionists and so on, it isn't. And very few hereditaries. And soon after I went in, most of the hereditaries were abolished. Um, there used to be eight or nine hundred, there's now hundred and moved to abolish those. It's a revising chamber. Um, I would rather it wasn't called the Lord, so would most of us. The funny thing about this is it isn't the Lords who want to be the Lords, it's the Commons. It is our House of Commons. This is bizarre, isn't it? But I'm telling you the truth. About umpteen years ago, when Blair was still in power anyway, we brought a motion in the Lords that the Lords should be voted for. It should be elected. And we elected, 100% elected, 80%, 70%, 60%, but seven different votes. And we passed all of those in the Lords, and the House of Commons blocked every one. It's very convenient for the House of Commons, the way it works at the moment. We're very cheap. Um, we have a lot of people like Nobel Prize winners. It's the only house in the world and people like that who really know what they're talking about. Um, and that maybe they want to join themselves later on. Um, that might be a factor. But <coughs> it's, you need a second chamber. If you saw the stuff that came out of the Commons, you need, you need a second chamber. <laughs> you need a revising chamber. And we are a revising chamber, basically. We don't make laws, we revise them. Now, I think we should be a committee, a revolving committee, attached to the Commons. But we say that, and the Commons says that. That's the elected Commons that we all are there. <laughs> they want to keep the laws. It's, a, it's, it's um, a bit of a paradox, but there it is. How did I feel I thought that? I felt I was walking around with a, a bucket of mercury on my head for a while. <laughs> and one of them is going to spill over me. <laughs> and, then, and then you realise that nobody's much interested in you. think, poof, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's Good morning. Yeah, my name is Shansa, and I'm really glad to be here. A um, light-handed question. You started and said it came from a small town in the north of England. 
we're from the north of England as well. Oh, I wanted to know what the name of that town. I'm sure everybody knows. And I just kept waiting for you to say, this is the, you know, I'm from this community in the north, and you never, just a small town, 5,000 plus. I know I want that name. Oh, I'll tell you about that. What's the name of your town? It's called, called Wigton, W I G T O N, Wigton. Wigton. And it, uh, it, 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 it was very near where there was a big Roman encampment about a mile away from it. And the, the town was founded by, really, it was founded by the Vikings in the 8th and 9th century. My surname is a Viking name, it gives me, gave me some. Uh, uh, come back against the teachers who used it <laughs> against me all the time. Uh, Viking, a tiny little town, and then it grew a little bit, and uh, it struggled up to five, I think it's about five and a half thousand now. Wigton, and it's a, it's good, little town with all sorts of bad things about it, I don't mean, to idealise it, and in the books I write in, um, everybody isn't goody goody, it isn't little women. Um, well, little women's not bad, if you to think of it, it's a good book. Um, fascinating book. Anyway, yeah, Wigton. Yeah, Wigton. And it's changed a lot. But it's good for centre out of it, which I miss enormously because that was really was, it was like old London. The houses were leaning against each other. There were slits in the wall, which is still our Cuba, for playing games at the time. It was a treat. You can't believe what a wonderful place it was. Wriggling. So but that's all gone, and now it's a course. Can't part with it. So. Um, on the other hand, the housing is 20,000 times better than the edges. Everybody's got in the indoor laboratory. We didn't have an indoor laboratory. Everybody's got a garden. We didn't have a garden. Um, all of that stuff. Um, uh, it's completely changed. And with the NHS, people are living longer and, uh, and one was <coughs> on the whole healthier. So it's changed. The centre of the town, which is still imprinted on my mind, Maybe all our breakfast, maybe our childish landscapes are the guiding landscapes of the rest of our life. That is what a place should be like. It's like when we were children. That has changed completely. Uh, the shops are still there, over there, and everybody who had a shop used to live above the shop. That's gone. They don't live above the shop now. They moved out. Not very far. I mean, they haven't moved to a contract. <laughs> they've just moved to an outer rim of the town into nicer houses. But it's still, I can find enough there that I want around in. And, uh, yeah. And I'm like, I go back a lot. I, uh, I, I bought a cottage uh, about, near there about, God knows what, maybe 50 years ago. And I keep going back to that. And so do the children, they like it. That's beautiful. And uh, okay, so we're going to have one last question if you can handle it. Because I'm, I'm just aware now that I've kept you talking for an hour. <laughs> You've been absolutely amazing and very, very gracious. So thank you. So we'll have the one last question. And then we will talk about, very briefly about your book. So that you can... No, no, we want to, because I've been reading it, it's just awesome. So, just one last question. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm from the North East, uh, from Scarborough, so I'm a Viking child as well, and a lot of what you said about your childhood resonates with me too. I had an idyllic childhood like that. And also the arts were very much there in our childhood. I had all the variety in the theatre in Scarborough. Uh, the current concern to do with cultural education is that we are not promoting the arts in a, in a particularly good way for children and young people, which I think is a concern. I don't know if you share that concern. But I was also interested, just very quickly, if you started reading at four, where did the books come from and what were you reading? What do the books in your, what, what are the books you remember in your childhood? Well, a lot of comics, that was important. We lived in somewhere called Council House Yard. Whitman wasn't noted for its originality in names. We lived in Station Road because it led to the station. And <laughs> up Station Road was Council House Yard because that's where the council kept its stuff, including the fire engine, including the place where the man who took the town clean, he kept his stuff there. Um, it also had the town library, run by the town clerk, or Mr. Carrick. And it was open two or three nights a week in our yard. There's also the yard where the women in the street hung all the washing. There's a big yard. And, um, and I used to go there, and it's in the corner. Mr. Carrick was a very nice man. And he used to say to the children's section, he's over there. And they said, he used to say, you might like this, or you might like that. Um, and then when I got to the grammar school, when I was 11, they still the <coughs> grammar schools in those days. And then the war changed that again. But the butler at the Tory, 
enabled people to go to grammar schools without, uh, without having to pay. You could get a scholarship. And I got scholarships forever more. I didn't pay a penny for my education, not in my family. Uh, and um, when I got to grammar school, it was truly well at school. It's like you used to dive in and get your book and take them out and remember to return. <laughs> <laughs> so that was where the books came from. But lots of comics, that's when, and there's some very good comics. George Orwell wrote very well about comics, about the, the characters that you remember from comics, saying, you know, these, these were memorable characters. These were writers who were writing popular fiction in comics. Don't run them down. It's, there's quite a lot going on in, in these comics. Interesting that Japan, and now the comic in Japan, the adult novel is now a comic, and that's very well applauded. It's taking over in certain, certain segments of culture. When people say, when you want your influence, people say, oh, well, I've told story really. <laughs> and I was influenced by a middle-known French poet that I read on and all that sort of thing. Actually, you think, well, comics have quite a bit to do with it. They define characters very quickly. There would be stories of the beginning and middle man, uh, the recovery was good, uh, and so on. So all that came. But I just would read all the time. I remember reading. Robin Hood, I remember reading, Kidnapped, I remember reading, Pilgrim's Progress, I mean, all that stuff that showed through. And being read to, one thing I didn't mention, it's back to the gentleman behind you, what he would say, being read to, uh, for years and years and years, every Sunday and through the week, and at school, everyone, I was read to from the King James Bible. There was always a lesson at school. You were led, read to by some of the greatest pros, I and mean, I include Shakespeare, he included Shakespeare. I mean, it's a complicated way to deal with this, really. That language came into my head, and that was a big, big sediment of my head and, and many of my contemporaries. We heard it every day at school, we heard it all in church, and then the hymns and the psalms. You know, when, you, when I go to, sadly, funerals, my life is sort of four funerals and a wedding these days. <laughs> the, um, when they start singing the hymns, I find I know them off my heart. Yes. And I've been rather embarrassed. I pretend to be reading the <laughs> <laughs> Love Without End is your most recent book, a story of Heloise and Abelard. Um, absolutely beautifully written. I have to admit, I have not finish the book and I'll tell you why it's a good reason because normally when I'm going to do an interview and it's attached to a book you know I'll pretty much scan read it you know get to the really good points pick out the points I want to discuss but the prose in this and the dialogue and the flow of the stories because he, he starts of course with Heloise and Abelard of, of their love affair and their passion and this this vibrant you know, you've brought out her character so beautifully this vibrant young woman who just wants to be heard and just wants to live her life and just wants to have a say in her destiny and her future and then um, and how she's gone for this teacher and then of course how that that nap that love affair naturally then connects them, their, their love and their passion for the, the written word naturally connects them. But then he's tied it with the, in the, the, the now nine centuries later, 21st century, and then you have Arthur and his daughter Julia, and as they're exploring and digging into the history of the letters, and how then their relationship starts, um, you start seeing what they're searching for in life on their journey. And I can't speak to the end because I haven't got to the end and I'm being totally honest, because it wasn't a book to be rushed. It, I just couldn't scan read, I couldn't miss anything. It's like watching a really good movie, you just don't want to miss anything. And I couldn't scan. It's so beautifully written, the way you've combined all of their lives and their stories and their journeys. It's just like, you don't, I don't feel like I'm flitting from one, oh yeah, now I've gone back, oh now I'm here, now I'm just on one seamless journey. And it's absolutely beautifully written. Well, thank you very much. I don't think I'm going to say anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything I, could, anything I would say would just spoil it, frankly. <laughs> I would, I would if you don't mind. I think that's very good. Oh. Uh, can you come around with me? On these <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing these literary festivals, going to Hay and Edinburgh. It'd be very nice if you just jumped in the back of the car and we could do, we could do it together. Pop, pop open the booth Thank you very much. That'd be good. OK. <laughs> I just want to put out a warning. <laughs> I would call this a curiosity in my writing. I think it's a reasonable word. I mean, my writing comes, you've been talking about my background experience, 
and my intellectual experience, I could call it that. The, the life I and people like me have lived in this country over the last um, 70, 80 years, because it starts with my grandfather's life. He was born in the 19th century. That's the flow. But I was always nagged by this story, snagged by it when I was a, but when I was a boy at school. I read, read about it when I was 15. And it was hanging around and hanging around. And then I discovered the letters between them, which were extraordinary, extraordinary, savage and erotic. And, but it's, a, it's, it's about philosophy. And, and I didn't in the mainstream of my work. Um, and um, I just, what we've been talking about this morning does not include that book. I don't know where it came out of. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think it'll. I think it's over there. If, you, if, you, if your life's in and this little, if your life's sort of Africa, really, this is somewhere in Indonesia. This book, <laughs> 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 or maybe in Patagonia. <laughs> right, right. It's a way. I have no idea why I kept being drawn to it. I I, I try to work it out. Uh, it's nice to winkle things out, isn't it? When I was at school, when I was 15, for O levels, we read a book called the. The, the Cloister and the Hearth, by a man called Charles Reed. And nobody now reads these days, sorry about that. But they don't, but he was very famous in his day. And it's a medieval story. And at the end of it, he had these two people, Eloard and Abelise, walking around the garden. Told, he was the greatest philosopher of the 12th century, Abelard, fighting the church all the time, trying to change the church. His books were burned. He was castrated. Uh, he was hammered by the... He kept fighting at all. She was one of the very few women, very few women, who forced her, forced her own way. We don't know who her parents were. She was brought up in a, a nunnery, um, but forcing her way through her learning, through scholarship. And they fell in love, and then they were apart from each other for years, and it was a very strange story because she was supposed to be the cleverest woman in France, uh, she would be corresponding with archbishops and cardinals and people like that. He wrote directly to the Pope who replied and at the same time he was tried again and again for his views. His views were, quite, to put him quite simply, that what the sacred texts are telling you, not what the Bible is telling you, but what all the commentaries and that are telling you, they're actually telling you this in order to control you. They're not telling you the truth. The truth is if you cut through them, this is what's being said. This is what's being said by the apostles. Not what the commentaries say it says. It's what this is what it says. And as you all know from about the fourth of his century, the, the, the Gospels, for instance, were layer on layer and layer and layer of commentaries by later bishops and archbishops. And they were they were taken as the thing you could not challenge. And he challenged them. And you, you took that hold on. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's some nice novels in Cumberland, and, and one way and another. But it's very nice of you to mention it. And what you said, what you, what you said about the book, I'll tell you what, I heartily agree with this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I know I've got to stop now, because I know that um, I hope if you've got five minutes to sign some books for some people, because I well, know. I have tried to put you off signing. <laughs> Some very good paperbacks around with you. Ah, that's so <laughs> funny. The background. Um, the thank you so much for coming in. And the one thing that impressed me was that with all of your vast experience in your career and the books and everything you've said, it, it, I have this Im immense impression that what you have to say now and going forward is going to be so much more powerful and more heard. And it's like, it just kept, as I was reading throughout this month, that's all that kept coming to me is, listen to him because he's got something to say. And it was, that's what I meant about the John the Baptist reference. And I meant it with all due respect that you really have got in this, your latter days, what you're going to say now is going to be stronger than ever. And so we really do applaud you. So everyone, Melvin Bragg. Wow, that was a, an interview and a half. It was incredible. Thank you so much, Lord Melvin. It really gave an insight into some of that uh, early childhood and how the inspiration came about for your love of the arts. Well, it falls on me to give the thanks on behalf of Africa Center, on behalf of the Jabba Talk Show, 
And uh, really, it, it's, uh, anything like this is, uh, is a collaboration. So we give hearty thanks to Africa Center, represented here today by the director, Kenneth. We give thanks to Colorful Radio for making this possible and uh, all the technical wizardry that goes on behind the scenes, uh, conducted by the director himself or the founder and uh, the owner, Kofi. And of course, most importantly, we give thanks to uh, Jabba Talk Show, who were facilitators here and did this incredible interview. Jackie, thank you so much. Yeah, Primrose and books, and uh, we, we will definitely be looking at the Primrose Hill books who are here with the copies of the said book. But I want to just comment briefly on uh, the story of how we got Lord Melvin to be here today. This is now kind of gone into mythology as to what actually happened on that street on that day. Lord Melvin has his version. Jacqueline has her version. Now I will give you my version, okay? Because I was there. We were, we were coming up. Me and Jacqueline meet up like once a month and uh, we do something. We decided at the beginning of the year, we're going to just do something once a month that, you know, is, is enriching and, and makes us feel good. On that particular day, we were at uh, Fortnum & Mason's ice cream parlor. It was her treat for me, her time to treat. And we had a great time. And on the way back, we decided to go to the bookstore. Yeah, which bookstore was it? We were, uh, no, we were going to... Oh, we were going, Waterstones. We were going to Waterstones. And on the way there, there was this incredibly amiable character coming across the road. And Jacqueline said to me, Oh, is that that bloke, Bragg? <laughs> I said, maybe, I maybe, he said, maybe, I said, go on, go on, find out. And he said, oh, mate, are you that bloke Bragg? <laughs> and Lord Melvin said, Bragg by name, but not by nature. <laughs> and he says, if you two have time, if you two have time, I'm actually heading for a book launch. And uh, Jack said, can we come along? Can we, can we tag along? And Lord Melvin was very, very gracious to say, yes, we can. Total fiction, right? Total, total fiction. No. I saw Lord Melvin. I recognized him. I said, that's Lord Melvin. We went over. He was gracious enough to entertain us and talk to us for briefly. And says, having a book launch, would you like to come along? We did. And uh, he was gracious enough to give me a copy of his book to cut a long story, very short. We kind of corralled him into agreeing in principle to come here today. And we're so grateful that he has made it here today because it's been an incredible journey through that history of UK art. And I have to say this in closing. One of the reasons I'm passionate about the arts is because I used to watch the South Bank show. And it was so inclusive. So thank you, Lord Melvin, for making it here today, for making it so entertaining. And we really want to get into this book of yours. So we appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Take care.